Hello, and thank you very much for coming along once again. Today we're going to look at the wisdom of an ancient proverb. If you do not change direction, you will most likely end up where you are headed. This is attributed to the Chinese, but it's basically available in any wisdom tradition. We need urgently to reevaluate where we are headed on the only blue planet in the known universe. If we're going to survive, we will need to learn how to value water on this water wealthy planet. We know that human markets can price water, but can price truly represent value in an ecosystem? The answer, I'm afraid, is no. <clears throat> At least the short answer. And the reason you might ask why is that price cannot represent value because price is inherently anthropocentric and the ecosystem is not. There is no central species in a functioning ecosystem. All species have to provide for one another in order for the system to work. You can't optimize or maximize the return of an ecosystem to any one species without destroying it. It's important to recall how many <clears throat> problems we have on our plate and how humanity has arrived at our current global water crisis. There have been warning signs for decades. Localized droughts over large areas like the Indian subcontinent. And as far back as 20 some years ago, we we're being warned by global media that billions will be without clean water. Even the Amazon, which was thought to be the source of a great amount of water, is experiencing drought and the drought widened in 2005. Furthermore, it's been underscored that water causes wars, undermines peace in many parts of the world, especially in the Middle East. Further, there are potential water wars emerging on the whole continent of Africa. And indeed, we're being warned that on a global scale, back in 2001 by the BBC News, that we'd be seeing water refugees from large parts of Asia and Africa. Of course, all of the water availability questions threaten harvests anywhere in the globe. These problems focus the world's attention very acutely in March of the year 2000 for a series of meetings in The Hague in the Netherlands called the World Water Forum. It's worth looking at that in detail and seeing what occurred at that set of meetings. Following on from them, there was a big water debate that emerged in the entire following decade hosted and spurred on in a way by Boutros Boutros Ghali, the Secretary General of the United Nations. And people have started to keep track of transboundary water problems as well as localized water problems. You can keep in touch with them through pages on the transition studies and elsewhere in the news. Let's look back again at the 2000 meetings that took place in The Hague. In a country where there's water everywhere, too much water, comes a global warning of scarcity and crisis. Symbolized here in song and dance, and bluntly expressed by ministers and water experts. These facts justify the language of crisis, heard more and more in relation to the issue of water. Disturbing facts. A billion people without access to safe drinking water. 
three million deaths a year from water-related diseases. And it will get worse, says the World Bank, unless there's a fundamental shift from public to private, giving water a price tag and letting free enterprise move in where governments have failed, becoming suppliers to meet the needs of a growing population. I say, let us discuss things. What has worked and what has not worked? Ismael Saragaldin is chairman of the World Commission on Water. There's no expectation that government resources would be able to make the jump from 70 to 80 billion dollars a year to 180 billion dollars a year. This has been an outrageous display of arrogance, of corporate control, of control by the World Bank. The Council of Canadians and Labour Unions tried to lead a rebellion here, a small voice against the power and influence of the World Bank. Water, they argue, is not a commodity to be bought and sold, but a vital precious resource that needs protecting from the multinational. We're here to say that if these people succeed in making water a commodity to be sold on the open market, protected by the global trade agreements like the WTO, there will be millions and millions of people who will die. Is water a product or a right? Is privatization good or bad? The debate seems endless. The crisis is real. Without a massive change in water management, say the experts, the consequences for the globe could be catastrophic and in a very short number of years. Paul Workman, CBC News, The Hague. Well, the meetings at The Hague marked a very important turning point, especially because of the intervention of Maud Barlow and the Council of Canadians. You'll remember she made a very strong statement that the CBC correspondent recorded and in effect made it available to the world. Let's recall what she said. And this has been an outrageous display of arrogance, of corporate control, of control by the World Bank. The Council of Canadians and Labour Unions tried to lead a rebellion here, a small voice against the power and influence of the World Bank. Water, they argue, is not a commodity to be bought and sold but a vital precious resource that needs protecting from the multinational. We're here to say that if these people succeed in making water a commodity to be sold on the open market, protected by the global trade agreements like the WTO, there will be millions and millions of people who will die. Her statement was so strong that she organized the Council of Canadians the following year in July of 2001 to hold a conference specifically attacking the idea of the water privatization that had been forwarded in The Hague. It's worth listening to this at length as well. We're at a transformative moment. I believe in the next five years we'll have the decisive period. To go up against nations, multinational corporations, corporate states. We are at the very center of what is going to happen. About whether the commercial market logic of global corporations will work, or whether the earth logic of the sustenance of life, including our lives, will work. We are on the cusp of a great set of decisions around what will happen to the world's water. Welcome to the water revolution. And welcome to Vancouver. overstate the crisis of the world's fresh water situation in any way. There is no language that we can have that overstates what we're dealing with. Life may not go on because what's happening now is on a planetary level, massive scale, and can affect every single person. The cause of the war, and that if there are wars in the 21st century, it will be caused by water. When we defeated apartheid, the whole world sighed, you know, relief that one of the most evil systems had disappeared but now 
we see the multinational corporations coming with even something more evil to steal life itself, to steal water. The world's water is imperiled, and the way we are moving now is going to ensure us that whole ecosystems collapse, that whole species collapse, and that many millions, perhaps billions of people will die because we have decided on a water survival of the fittest mode. We have a water crisis because of commercial activities not respecting the water cycle and the limits of water. Logging was about commerce. It has destroyed our catchments. Mining was about commerce. It has absolutely devastated our aquifers. Industrial agriculture was about commerce. It has drained our water systems dry. Commerce does not solve ecological crises. It creates them. There are, I would say, a handful of transnationals, although there's more than one in, who have the full intention of privatizing the entire world's water stock. The same companies, the same Bechtel, the same Vivendi, the same Swiss Lyonnaise are all over trying to colonize the water of the world. The same Monsantos are trying to colonize the seeds and biodiversity of the world. The same Gargils and ADMs are trying to control our food systems. They literally do not believe anything belongs in the commons, not health care, not education, not air, not seeds, not genes, and certainly not water. They consider it blue gold. They're backed by international institutions like the World Bank, which is forcefully promoting privatization of water uh, in developing countries. How did private water companies make it to Benin, Honduras, Nicaragua, Niger, Panama, Rwanda, Tanzania, and other poor nations, they've had their access delivered by the IMF and the World Bank. The World Bank around the world places conditions that impose water privatization. We know that privatization, particularly privatization uh, by large multinational corporations, will increase the suffering of people. International trade agreements, whether NAFTA, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trades with its WTO, the upcoming Fair Tr uh, Trade Agreement of the Americas, or Free Trade Agreement of the Americas, guarantee corporations the right to water. The basic thing about international trade agreements is that they exist as a constitution which supersedes the sovereign prerogatives of governments at all levels. You have to comply with these rules or you can be punished very severely uh, by the imposition of international trade sanctions or damage awards in the case of foreign investor claims. We access your resources, your trees, your fish, your water, on whatever terms we dictate, without having to invest a penny in your community or add any value to those resources before we extract them. That's free trade in a nutshell. The World Trade Organization, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and even the upcoming Free Trade Area of the Americas all include water as a, as a tradable good, as an investment, and now coming now as a service. I think that it's important to have trade agreements which guarantee all people's access to water. Around the world, the forces that want to sell off and privatize our water are organizing like never before, but also in this country and across the globe, the forces of resistance are mobilizing like never before, and we're also here to celebrate some important victories, including the one that happened here in Vancouver just last week. This is what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. I am a very angry mother who has a lot of time on her hands, and I will be here for Vancouver Regional District is bowing to public pressure and abandoning an unpopular plan to privatize a local water filtration plant. Well, water belongs to the communities. It is a commons. It is, cannot be privatized. It cannot be made the property of a handful of corporations. And the communities have to lead the way to show their governments what they want and to tell the corporations what are the limits. a major participant in Maud Barlow's conference was Vandana Shiva, who made it very clear that water belongs to the communities. It's a commons, as she put it.
it cannot be privatized. It cannot be made the property of a handful of corporations. Communities have to lead the way to show their governments what they want and to tell the corporations what happens. Well, the demand for public ownership may be strong in where water is abundant, as in the case of Canada. But we have to ask, what about regions where water is already scarce? This is an aerial shot, a close up in a sense, from above about an area where there is water scarcity, but there's also water abundance. It could be anywhere in a way, anywhere that has suburbs that allow for swimming pools. It's a very interesting snapshot in a way. It could be the American Southwest, like in Arizona, for example. But as it turns out, this is a region in the driest continent, and in fact, one of the cities that's the driest cities in the world, Adelaide, Australia. It's a crucial place to start looking at the questions of water storage, very opposite of Canada. Canada has about an estimated 25% of the world's fresh water because of all the ice and snow in its northern territories. But what's happening in the southern part of Australia, the driest continent, and in Adelaide, the driest city on the driest continent? Let's take a closer look. In many respects, of course, the population is showing evidence of being quite green. They're putting solar panels on their roof, at least. But what about the water and how it's showing up in privatized space, pools for the comfort of the inhabitants who own these properties in the driest city on the driest continent? The issue becomes ever more acute for coastal cities facing severe weather and sea level changes. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, we've begun to focus on it. And in fact, the government, along with the whole series of agencies uh, from the private sector, has started putting out extended reports as the one that was just issued by the US government called Global and Regional Sea Level Rise Scenarios for the United States. Well, the global sea level, but the issue for that publication was the United States. And then locally, newspapers are taking up discussions of what it means for them locally, as in the case here in Boston. What's rising sea levels mean for, for Boston's case? Well, you can read about it in the Boston Globe. But the question would be whether in Australia they're looking at the same set of problems. The report on the left calls itself global and regional sea level rise scenarios, but it's confined to the United States. What are the implications of global sea level rise for coastal cities like Adelaide in Australia, where water is already scarce and rising sea levels could compromise water supplies, fresh water supplies, very quickly. Let's take a look at what's happening in Australia. South Australia is on extreme alert as searing temperatures put emergency crews on notice and authorities ready to answer any major crisis. Records fell today and more are set to tumble tomorrow, with Adelaide forecast to hit 45 degrees, nudging the hottest day on record for the city. The CFS warns it won't be able to control any major blazes if there... Adelaide in southeast Australia, the driest city on the driest continent on the planet. Adelaide serves as a think tank. It is here, at the university, that the idea of water trading was conceived. And in some years, you might get zero water. 
So they said nobody could take any more water, so you're going to have to find a way to share water. Mike Young is the founding father of the Australian water markets. A renowned economist, he attended Harvard University and has advised the United Nations. This is the man writing the new history of water. Water scarcity is really there. So water scarcity is part of the future of the world. The global predictions are that by 2050, more than half the world will be living with limited water resources and abundance is a thing of the past. Water needs to be managed in a very precious way. In a way that drives innovation, that makes sure our water goes to the best use as it possibly can. So we make money and feed ourselves well. And that led to the interest in water markets and drove a revolution. The revolution started by Mike Young has turned climate imbalance into a market force. It's fascinating to see how sophisticated our water markets have become. If there's rain forecast in a week's time, the price of water will go down because farmers know they won't have to irrigate. If it's going to be really hot for the next fortnight, then the price of water goes up. Mike Young has opened up water markets to all. Farmers, municipalities, small investors, and above all, professional traders. Nowadays, everybody can buy water on the stock market for consumption or simply as a vehicle for speculation. When water becomes scarce, and as it becomes scarcer, then somebody has to stop using it. And what markets do is they discover and reveal the most appropriate people to pull out of agriculture. As it is for making cars, as it is for lots of things, we live in a competitive world. Australia's new Lords of Water live in Melbourne, one of the country's business centres. They are bankers, insurers, pension and investment fund managers, and they are gradually taking control of this blue gold. I don't need to own land. You know, would I own land? Would I consider it? Yes, but I'm not a farmer. I'm an investment banker. How much did you invest? Uh, not much, maybe $20 million. The price of water has doubled, but in the next 10 years it will double again because of intensive agriculture. Nicknamed the Water Bandit, David Williams rules over his empire from the 45th floor of an office tower. As an owner of expansive water reserves, he rents his water to farmers as others would rent land. And his future looks bright. If we go to 9 billion population and the Chinese want more food and the Indonesians want more food and the Indians want more food and they can afford to pay for it, then we need to find more intensive ways of growing food. That means more water. And that's going to lead you smack bang into how you get that water, how you price it, how you allocate it and how you regulate it. With the big investors buying water, it's getting back to the old days of the landlords and the peasant farmers. And if we want to survive or stay into it, we're going to have to buy the water at what the landlords deemed the water is worth. Back to the Middle Ages, yeah. Water was the last remaining natural resource to have escaped trading. 
but Australia has pulled the plug on that exemption. Because water offers an opportunity for greater profitability and wealth. I'm a Narinri elder. I speak on behalf of my people, on behalf of this land and this water. Water, for me and my people, is a part of who we are. It's a part of our stories, our creation stories. Today is different. Australia has gone ahead and implemented water markets. Yeah. How do you look at that? We don't like it very much. We don't like it at all. Well, we'll see. We have to paint up everyone else first. Okay? That's the timeline from my paint today. Selling, trading, what does it? Filling your dams up, making sure that you've got your share, making sure that no one else takes yours. Part of it is madness, and most of it is greed. Greedy people. They want the water, but they also want that. And they'll sell it to somebody else for money. You can't eat money. You can't drink money. <laughs> 